is December 8, 1909, and a fire has broken out in the cargo hold of the steamship Clarion. Soon her steering gear and lights are lost as she begins drifting helplessly in a winter gale. Suddenly, a huge bulk freighter appears out of the blizzard and grazes Clarion. As the Clarion's crew members desperately try to signal for help, the vessel continues on its course. Who was this vessel that passed Clarion, and why didn't they stop? Better yet, why was Clarion out in the storm in the first place? Officially, the Great Lakes 1909 shipping season was supposed to end on December 5th when Vessel's marine insurance expired. Many owners, however, obtained extensions that allowed them to continue sailing in order to squeeze every last bit of profit. Sailing on the Great Lakes in the months of November and December was extremely risky. Regardless of how much sailors preferred to be on shore leave, Vessel owners ultimately decided when a boat lays up for the season. While owners gamble with money, we gamble with our lives, said an anonymous sailor in a 1909 Duluth Herald newspaper. It was through this gambling that the Clarion was still making runs. In the early hours of December 7, 1909, the Clarion was in Chicago, being prepared for another voyage. The Clarion was a package fader, completed in 1881 by the Detroit Dry Dock Company in Wyandotte, Michigan. She was owned by the Erie and Western Transportation Company, better known as the Anchor Line. The Anchor Line was the Pennsylvania Railroad's Great Lakes fleet, which operated passenger and freight steamers between Buffalo, Erie, Chicago, and Duluth. Clarion was a duplicate copy of Anchor Line's package freighter, Lehigh, built a year prior by the Detroit Dry Dock Company. Designated as hull number 45, Clarion was 1,711 tons and had an iron hull that measured 240 feet in length and a beam of 36 feet. She was powered by a compound steam engine and a single boiler built by the Dry Dock Engine Works. While Clarion was in Chicago, she was loaded with sacks of flour, corn, and mixed merchandise destined for Erie, Pennsylvania. Under the command of Captain Thomas J. Bell and a crew of 20, the Clarion was ready to set sail that morning. Captain Bell had over 20 years of experience and this was his first season taking command of the Clarion. By 8 a.m., a northwesterly gale was setting over the Great Lakes. At 11.30 p.m., Clarion was making its way downbound to the Detroit River when it was temporarily held up at Detroit with a convoy of other boats. On the afternoon of December 8th, Clarion and the convoy were once again on their way to tackle the last leg of the Detroit River. When Clarion entered Lake Erie, she encountered the full force of the gale. The wind was howling at 40 to 50 miles per hour, and heavy seas and blinding snow battered her. Yet this didn't dissuade Captain Bell as he pushed his vessel onto its destination. By nightfall, Clarion had entered Pelee Passage, located between Pelee Island and Point Pelee, Ontario. It is one of the most dangerous regions of Lake Erie in any weather because of its shallow waters and navigational hazards. Near the eastern end of the passage is a point called Southeast Shoal. A lightship named the Kiwani was anchored off the shoal that night to warn vessels of the danger. This shoal, however, was the least of Captain Bell's concerns. Clarion was about one and a half to two miles west of this lightship at approximately 7 p.m. when a fire was discovered in her cargo hold amidships and was spreading rapidly. Due to the combustible nature of flour, it was all hands on deck to extinguish the fire. Captain Bell blew Clarion's whistle to alert nearby vessels that they were in danger, hoping that one would come to their aid. However, due to the severity of the storm and how the blaze was confined inside the cargo hold, this action was useless. Any vessel that did hear Clarion, though, couldn't locate it through the blizzard and dense vapor rising from the water. Nearly seven boats had passed her since this deadly dilemma started. While Captain Bell was trying to signal for help, first mate James Thompson grabbed a fire extinguisher and dashed into the hold to put out the flames. He was never seen again, and it's assumed he died as a result of smoke inhalation. Not long after he went below deck, the ship's wood conduits burned, causing all the electric lights to go out. With the fire now out of control, Clarion's steering gear was lost, making the boat impossible to maneuver. The boat began drifting eastward due to the strong gusts and waves. Half an hour behind Clarion was the 540-foot bulk freighter HP Boat. She was carrying grain and making full steam at 11 to 12 miles an hour from her destination in Buffalo. At 7.30 p.m., 
the vessel was navigating through Pelee Passage when Captain Colin Balfour, Pope's master, spotted Clarion in distress. Captain Balfour immediately ordered his wheelsmen to put her hard to starboard to take a closer look. When Bope approached Clarion, she grazed her on the port side from bow to stern as Balfour opened the door of the pilot house to get a better view. It was the nearest I have ever come to sinking two boats since I have been on the lakes, said Balfour in a statement. He couldn't see any lights or fire in the murky conditions. With no one responding to his shouts, the boat pulled away, blowing us a stress signal. As one of the first ships in the Great Lakes to have a wireless telegraph, Bope sent a message indicating that an unnamed ship was in distress two miles off Southeast Shoal. Not far behind the boat were two other freighters, the 530-foot Hosiah G. Monroe and the 504-foot Leonard C. Hanna. Fortunately, both boats had wireless telegraphs and were able to receive the boat's transmission. The Monroe, the vessel directly behind the boat, slowed down and prepared to assist Clarion. Because Bope's message was vague, her master, Captain Corden Sayer, was unsure of Clarion's exact location. Around 8 p.m., he noticed low-lying lights off the starboard side of Monroe's bow while peering through the storm. He ordered his helmsman to put her hard a starboard and signaled engine stop on his chadburn. While trying to make out Clarion's lights, Captain Sayer heard voices shouting in the storm. Suddenly, her hulk appeared 200 feet off Monroe's starboard bow and was closing rapidly. Clarion's crew members were shouting at the top of their lungs and waving flickering oil lanterns on deck. Captain Sayer immediately ordered their engines full astern and all hands on deck to avoid a collision. With an intimate collision averted, Clarion was carried by the wind and waves in the opposite direction until they lost sight of her. As Monroe came around to port, they saw a massive flare of flame lighting up the darkness 300 feet off her port bow. The fire had finally broken through Clarion's deck, confirming the vessel's identity. Captain Sayer ordered hard to starboard to bring Monroe around to leeward so Clarion could drift towards her. The helm was not responding to the maneuver, so Sayer ordered full astern to swing Monroe's stern towards Clarion. Meanwhile on board, Captain Bell, realizing his ship was doomed, ordered his crew to abandon ship. The raging inferno had split Clarion's crew into two groups, making a coordinated escape impossible. Captain Bell and 12 men confined to the bow area launched a metallic yawl boat. They made a mad dash towards Monroe until a massive wave washed the boat away out of the Monroe site. Soon after, seven men led by Clarion's chief engineer, Alfred E. Welch, attempted to launch one of the ship's wooden lifeboats from the stern davits. They were unable to launch it, and oiler George McCauley fell overboard in the process. The remaining six men were now stranded on the stern. Soon after witnessing these events, Captain Sayer heard the lightship sound a danger signal, alerting them that they were too close to Southeast Shoal. With no time to perform a new maneuver, the Monroe had grounded on an outlying shoal. The crew of the lightship, unable to launch a boat in the rough seas to aid in the rescue, watched in horror as all these events unfolded. It was now up to the Leonard C. Hanna, the ship following the Monroe to save Clarion's remaining crew. Around 9 p.m., Hanna had located the stricken vessel, which had drifted a mile east of the lightship. Captain Matthew Anderson determined the best option was to bring the Hanna close enough so that the remaining crew could jump aboard. In one of the most daring rescues in the Great Lakes, Hanna circled Clarion two times in a row before they were in position. Five men successfully jumped aboard from Clarion's fantail until Hanna fell into a trough. Captain Anderson was forced to circle back one more time, allowing Chief Engineer Welch to jump over, effectively ending the nearly four-hour nightmare. Shortly after, the ship burned to its waterline and sank. Exhausted and freezing, Clarion's remaining crew members were taken to Cleveland, Ohio and put on the train to Buffalo, New York. In the days following the disaster, they gave statements condemning the actions of H.P. Bope and her master, Captain Colin Balfour. They claimed that the boat had stopped, all of Clarion's crew could have survived. As one of Clarion's firemen said, Like brutal cowards, they kept right along on their course and left us to die like rats in a trap. Captain Balfour, in defending his actions, said he couldn't stop his vessel in an instant, as every mariner knows. Even if he could, they were near a rocky coast during a blizzard with two ships coming behind him. By the time he could safely turn around east of the lightship, Captain Balfour saw the Hanna already rendering assistance to Clarion's crew. Even Anchor Line's management came to defend Balfour. While Clarion's surviving crew members demanded a federal investigation into his actions, none was ever held. 
The exact cause of the fire was never determined either. Out of the 15 crew who perished at ill-fated night, only two of the bodies were ever recovered. On April 6, 1910, the body of oiler George McCauley was found in the Niagara River. Finally, on October 7, 1910, Captain Thomas Bell's body was located on the shore near Merlin, Ontario. His remains were taken back to his hometown of Ogdensburg, New York, where he was laid to rest. By the end of the 1909 season, 30 vessels had been lost and approximately 94 people had perished. During the same storm Clarion burned, two other vessels and 37 lives were lost in Lake Erie alone. In recognition of his bravery, Captain Matthew Anderson was awarded the bronze ship clock for his actions by the Western Transportation Company. He continued sailing until his retirement at the end of the 1931 season and passed away in 1952. Captain Colin Balfour, seven years later, would heroically rescue the stranded crew of the barge Dorsey Hartnell. The barge was under the tow of the bulk freighter SR Kirby until it sank in the Lake Superior Gale on May 8, 1916. He too was recognized for his bravery and presented with a special watch. Clarion's wreck lies in Canadian waters, just east of Southeast Shoal, 30 miles north of Lorraine, Ohio. Her hull was severely damaged from the intensity of the fire. Its stern sits on the bottom up high, and her bow remains folded in at an upward angle. <laughs>